This is going to be unlike anything you guys have ever seen before. Okay? This is a real estate seminar. I am a sales guy, and I'm not going to sell you anything. I'm not even going to attempt to sell you a little, tiny, teeny bit of anything. You will never see this again for as long as you live. Okay? So what I want to talk to you about today is uh, you know, I am from Springfield uh, with uh, Dixie, and I just want to talk about how and why people buy. So what I want to do today is just give you kind of a sneak peek into, into a, a seller's mind or a buyer's mind, whatever you, however you want to look at it. But before I get into the content, and it should just be a little entertaining and fun, a fun way to kind of wrap things up today, uh, I just want to find out a little bit about you so I know how to kind of tailor what I say and, and what I do up here. So uh, what I'm looking for is what type of real estate are you all in? I know you're, you're learning about student housing now. I see Andrew in the back. I know what you do. Uh, but, but anyone else actively participating now, buying, selling houses, rental properties? Okay, what kind of stuff do you do? Just shout it out. It's okay. A little everything. Commercial properties. Commercial. Cars. What don't you do? <laughs> All right. Anyone else? Airbnb. Airbnb. Awesome. And, and anyone else? Flips. Okay. Flips. So go ahead. Wow. There's a little bit of, of, of everything. Okay. So is it important to be able to buy that property, that land, at a pretty deep discount? So that's, that's what we'll talk about today. So uh, hopefully when you walk away from this, you'll have a better idea of kind of how to craft those conversations and know what your, what your prospect is thinking as you're talking to them. So who am I? Uh, I do some investment in a few markets. Uh, I travel around the country and I, I train sales teams for uh, really the best investors in the country. People who are doing 50 deals a year to about 1,000 deals a year. Uh, people with very large teams. Um, who operate in, in some cases, 15, 20, 30 markets around the country. So I write their scripts. I uh, write their scripts with the phone calls. I train their salespeople who go out to, to homes to buy houses. Um, I build their sales training programs. I, I do all that stuff. Um, I'm an investor machine advisor. Uh, I'm in a bunch of masterminds. Uh, I own a call center that does nothing but take inbound calls from leads, letters, and stuff like that that go out. Um, and we've actually deployed sales systems in about 50 industries now. Real estate's kind of my, my baby right now. That's, that's my total focus for the last two years. This is who I really am, though. Uh, I'm a little awkward. You're probably picking up on that right now. Okay? I'm an introvert. I'm, I'm a dad almost five times over. My wife will have our fifth in uh, July. Thank you. So I'm a husband. I'm a homebody. I don't like to leave the house. I hate leave. I, I'm doing this because it's 30 minutes from home. Other than that, though, uh, I, th I think I've turned down two gigs this week because it involved a plane ride. And I just, I'm a homebody, right? Who else here likes to control their time and just wants to hang out at home? Right? A few of us. I know a lot of people think about, let's get into this business of travel, travel, travel. I just like to sit at home, you know? But so that's, that's the real me. And I, I tell you that just to say, even though I'm a sales guy, I, I wasn't born that way. And I'm naturally not that way. I'm not that way. That's not my personality. I mean, when you guys think of salespeople, what do you think, like, personality-wise? And just shout it out. Let's have a conversation. Pushy, Pushy. yeah, yeah. But, but, but not an introvert, right? Usually the life of the party, everybody look at me, look at me, look at me. I hide. I, I, I hid in the back when I got here, right? I was reluctant to even walk down the center here. Um, but I did. So I wasn't born a salesman. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, how I got started and how I kind of got to where I'm at, because I think it'll, it'll help this conversation along. So this is where it all started, my 1988 Mazda RX-7 convertible. I love that car, OK? This is the car I drove when I got my first sales gig. So my first sales gig, here's how it went. I was working for a catering company here in this town. I made 8 bucks an hour, basically delivering food to doctor's offices for pharmaceutical reps. Those salespeople would buy food, give it to the doctors. When the doctors came to get a bite, they'd try to sell them something real quick. That's how the whole business works, right? Anyone here in pharmaceutical sales? Okay. Any truth to that? Okay. So I was working at the catering company, and um, uh, my wife told me, you know, we, we were starting a family and all that stuff, and my wife told me, hey, John, it's, it's, it's time for you to get a real job. Eight bucks an hour is not going to cut it anymore. 
So I went to my boss and I, I, I told her, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quit and, and try something new. And she said, all right, see what you find. And I found a sales job for all commission, selling insurance, right? <laughs> and so I told her and she said, no, 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 no. You, I'm not letting you do that. And she had her, her, her Allstate agent came to the business to talk me out of getting into insurance, okay? He, no, you don't wanna do that. You, you've got a family you're building. So I did it, right? I did it with that RX-7. I took the passenger seat out. Uh, I traveled around five states and I went business to business. This is my first entry into sales. I thought it was gonna be glamorous, right? Because I saw the, the, the pharmaceutical reps, right? They're, they're always dressed to the nines. They drove nice cars. And if they didn't drive nice cars, they're just okay cars, but they didn't have to pay for them. They were provided for them. So I go, that's the life, right? So I got into sales. It wasn't like that. No heat, no AC. In the wintertime, I'd put my blanket around me. I had a, I had a little, uh, a little hand towel, and when the windows fogged up, I did that whole deal. I mean, it, it was absolutely horrible. But that's, that's how I started. And I traveled those five states, no sales training. Uh, I, was, I was given a, a laminated flip book with about 10 or 12 pages in it. I talked about the company and that kind of stuff. And they said, what you do is you go, you find a business owner that'll talk to you. And if they say yes, flip through that book, read it to them, and then ask them for a check. So I did that over and over and over, right? Five states, on the road for weeks at a time, I just did my loops. Um, I out-hustled everyone, in about nine or 10 months, the company said, you're doing something right, would you like to open up an, an, an office in St. Louis? So I went to Chesterfield, I was the one and only employee, uh, all like 20 years old, and I learned very quick that I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, what I did know, what I did was I out-hustled everyone, right? I just worked my butt off. That's how I made sales. They thought I had, had something special. I didn't. I just, I just worked hard, right? I mean, lots of us, I mean, we all know, you don't have to be especially talented to make it, right? You just got to work your butt off, and that's what I did. But when I started building an agency, I had to hire agents, and I had to train them to sell. And it's really hard to train somebody to just work their butts off. They either do or they don't, right? So I had to teach them to sell, and I learned real quick I had a problem. Not only did I have to teach them, teach them to sell, I had to sell them the all commission job, right? You gotta pay to get all this licensing done, I'm not guaranteeing you anything, the job kinda sucks, right? It was, it was a tough sale. So I knew, I, I didn't know how to sale, sell, and I didn't know how to train salespeople, okay? So that brings us to this group of individuals. So that's me back when I had hair, that's, that's what it looks like before you start sales. Uh, <laughs> Beautiful, huh? <laughs> Look how scared I was right there. I was freaking out. So I was at uh, American Republic Insurance Company in Des Moines there, the CEO, the president, a uh, pretty large company now. This gentleman, his name's Al Payone. He was a um, assistant football coach for the Colorado Bulldogs. Uh, he did a lot of their recruiting, and he did a lot of recruiting for this insurance company too. And Al kind of took me under his wing, and he said, I'll show you the ropes. I'll show you a recruiting process and a simple sales process to teach your guys. And, you know, we went from there. So he flew out to St. Louis. We spent a couple weeks together. Uh, long story short, six months down the line, we were doing a quarter million dollars a week in business. I had about 50 agents under me. It worked, right? That's my intro into, into kind of process. And we're going to talk a lot about sales process today, specifically uh, process, specifically sales process, but, but process nonetheless. So over the next 15 years or so, I kind of, I dove into it, right? When you go from eight bucks an hour and a year later, you're making about five, 6,000 a week, your eyes open, right? You go, what happened? There's something to this. So I started studying everything I could get my hands on, from the sales gurus of the day, the sales systems, to you know, neuroscience, behavioral economics, all that goofy stuff. And 15 years later, that's, that's what, what's happened. I lost all my hair. It's not pretty. But I learned a lot, OK? At least you don't have a pot belly. Not yet. Not yet. It's coming. I see it creeping up on me. So today we're going to talk about kind of how and why people buy. So all the stuff I've learned over the years, I've kind of been able to boil down into some, some pretty simple stuff. And I think we'll shed some light on why when we try to sell or buy homes or, or anything we're selling, it's applicable to anything, why our prospects sometimes do the goofy stuff they do, like not return phone calls, uh, tell you lots of good stuff, and then hide from you back out of deals, all that kind of stuff, we're gonna go over exactly why they do that. Do you guys think that'll be useful? Oh, yeah. Okay. 
So we're going to explore this. I just did this slide last night, so I have to read it because I don't know what it says. So we're going to explore this, uh, explore the decision process from a few perspectives to uncover how and why people buy. Okay, we're going to look at the prospects buying system. So first, I want to look at when people are buying something and there's a salesperson involved. What does that system kind of look like? After we talk about that, I want to talk about the traditional sales process, kind of the sales process pr that all of us use, all of us know. We go through probably on a daily basis or whenever we buy something. And then I want to talk about another system or process, how people buy stuff when there's no salespeople involved. It's different, okay? And after we get through those three things, I think um, you'll understand a lot more why, why people you're trying to buy from or sell to do the goofy things that they do, and I think it'll help you out quite a bit. So let's start from the beginning. From when you get up and out of bed in the morning, you kind of have a routine, right? We all do. I get up, I uh, sneak out of my bedroom, because if I wake up my wife, it's, it's not good. Uh, I, I have this, I try to take this little workout shake, it's, it's nasty, but I drink it, I go to the gym, I come home, I have breakfast, I get my kids up, I take them to school, I've got my, my routine, right? Then I shower for the day, I walk five feet to my home office, and I'm at work. That's, that's kind of how I start the day. But what if I did it a little differently? What if I got up, took a shower, took the kids to school, came home? It doesn't work, right? It'd be all jacked up. We all brush our teeth before or after we eat. Like, like how many people in here brush their teeth after they eat breakfast? And how many before? You do both. That's insane. <laughs> we all have our, our habits, right? Our processes. Because we know when we do things a certain way, we get a certain outcome, right? So we take the same ways to work. We get out of bed and, and do our morning routine the same. Uh, processes, they, there's a rhyme and reason to them. If we look at business, let's look at manufacturing. Let's look at the, the good old assembly line, OK? Let's say that some of these cars, I don't know what kind of cars they are, but let's say that's a Ford Taurus. Do they make Tauruses anymore? Yeah. Pharmaceutical rep. I think so. That's kind of the. Uh, the company I work with will get a little bit better grade. <laughs> nice. So let's say these are Ford Tauruses coming off the line. And every car that comes off the line, there is some type of, of malfunction with it, right? If something's wrong. They're damaged. It's a faulty product. What do you think Ford would do? Do you think Ford would take that car off the line? and individually take it into the shop and fix them one by one? Or do you think they would find out where in that process the things went wrong and, 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 and fix that? The process, yeah. the process right? It, it would just be absolutely nuts to just say, yeah, that's it's a faulty car. We'll just fix every single one as they pop off the line. You're going to find out what's broken in the system. Because if we fix that, what comes out the other side are, are good cars, right? So that, that's, that's it, it's all process. That's, that's why we use process, is because when we use a certain process, we can start to predict the outcome of that process, right? We want certain outcomes in life, and in everything we do, whether it's manufacturing or getting out of bed or, or, or making a pizza, because we know if we do use a certain process, we get a certain outcome. Make sense so far? Simple, right? So let's talk about the prospect's buying system when a salesperson's involved, because there's a, a, a pretty, pretty simple uh, process here too, okay? Now this is not the same when there's not a salesperson involved, but let's go through it. I'm going to tell you, and you can disagree with me, that at first they're going to mislead you. You might not believe, how many people don't believe me? Wow. Everyone in here is just kind of a, a just skeptic, right? So I was looking for a nicer word. <laughs> But let's take this example, right? The, kind of the, the, the example, that when people think of salespeople, you think of that car salesman, right? I mean, that's kind of the stereotypical salesperson. That's who you picture in your head. So let's say you guys are shopping for cars tomorrow, and you walk onto a car lot, right? You, you're looking for a car because you're in the market for one. And as you're walking on, the sales guy, you see him coming. He comes up to you, and he says, what can I do for you today? What are you going to say? Okay. Why, why would you say just looking? You're obviously there for a reason. Don't want to be structured. Okay. What if, what if you walked onto that car lot and you know there was, there was a car you wanted and it was on two or three different lots throughout town and you just needed the best price on each one, 
Okay, follow me. You just need the best price on each one. You got to go to the car lot to get it, but you know if you just ask for the price, you're doing like credit checks. It's, it's, we've all been through that process, right? It's like a two, three hour ordeal and you just want the price. <laughs> if I were in that situation, I'd go in and I'd, I'd not mislead with less enthusiasm like the example we just gave. I'd say, hey, I'm buying today. I know exactly what car I want and I'm not messing around. What I need is your best price, and I need it quickly. What do you think that salesperson's gonna do? They're running back to the manager. Give me the best price, boss. I got a buyer here. Let's shut this thing down. I'm gonna take that price and move on. You're gonna mislead with more or less enthusiasm. How many of you guys who, who are buying houses at a discount, talk to someone on the phone, or um, maybe you talk to them on the phone. What does everyone want when you talk to them on the phone if you're doing yellow letters or anything like that? How much are you gonna give me? Right? How many people talk to you and they're super pumped up and motivated to sell? Hey, I'm selling today, I'll sell to you, I'll sell to whoever comes out here first, what's your best price? You spill the beans and then you never hear from them again. Has that happened to anybody? It's happened to me, right? So I'm gonna argue that you mislead with more or less enthusiasm, right? Then do your research. We're back on the car lot, we'll kick some tires, we'll uh, you know, play with the knobs, sit inside, uh, any other guys in here pop the hood and look at the engine? I, I do. My dad did. I don't know what I'm looking at. <laughs> right? It's usually just a plastic cover over there, but I look at it and I kind of shake my head and I go, it's, it's clean. <laughs> right? Salesman goes, yep. I shut the hood. It's just, it's my thing, right? It's, it's, that's a different story. So we do our research, right? That's what we do. After that, we usually mislead again. So let's stay on that car lot. Stay with me. So we get in there, we do our research, we're poking around, we fall in love. Who's fallen in love with the vehicle before? It might just be the guys here. I don't know. Okay. What kind of car? The Mitsubishi 2000 Yeah. Oh, man, I love those. I loved those. I've fallen in love with a lot of cars. We, we end up with a new car about every six months. Uh, we just bought two new ones about six months ago. It, it, it's an obsession. But... Pretend you fell in love with the car on that lot, and you knew you had to have it. So you're thinking those things, you know, you know those things you think when there's something you want and you can't really afford it, and you start making those bargains with yourself. You're like, I just take lunch to work, you know, every day, and that frees up some money, and, and that's how bad you want it. You're making those excuses. And the car salesman walks back up to you, and you gotta have this car, and he says, what do you think? What are you gonna say? <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, what would you say? Why aren't you saying, I love this car, I gotta have it today? Because you don't have a ticket for it. Right. So you mislead again. <laughs> if you don't buy, you go dark. Who's chased sellers around before? Okay. How many people have salespeople chasing you right now and you're avoiding their calls and emails? <laughs> <laughs> Works both ways, right? Here's the deal. We have to understand that whether we're buying or selling anything, if we want someone to change what they're doing, if we want to influence them to make a decision, and they're dealing with the salesperson, they're afraid you're going to waste their time, afraid you won't understand, they're afraid they're going to be tricked, they won't get the best deal, they'll be taken advantage of. All those things you guys have already said when we talked about the car, the car lot, right? You don't think of yourselves that way because you walk into a situation, you know you're going to do your best job, and you're not going to mislead or... Does anyone walk into a house or, or, or any situation intentionally misleading anyone? No. But that's what we think when, we, when we're confronted with salespeople, right? That's what we think when, when we deal with salespeople, when they approach us. But for some reason, we forget that when we're on the other side of the coin and we're ringing a doorbell. Does this all make sense? Okay. Prospects afraid and embarrassed. How does a traditional selling system fit in? Well, let's look at the traditional approach first. Usually in sales, here's what happens. Hey, tell me about what you need. All right, let me show you all the bells and whistles of this fancy product. It's gonna blow your doors off, knock your socks off, whatever it is. Um, they go on and on and on about how this is the greatest product in the world. Then I'm gonna ask you to buy that product, and then you're gonna tell me no, I'm gonna try to find a way to close you. If I don't, you're going dark, I'm chasing you. Does that look pretty, is that pretty standard for a sales process? That's buy the book. So you see, when you put those two processes together, traditional selling versus how the, the prospect buys, you learn something really interesting really fast. 
Traditional salespeople have conditioned us over time to behave the way we do. When we don't answer questions, when we kind of hide and, and, and mislead or don't give all the information or, or give misleading information, when we don't return calls, messages, all that funny stuff that we do when we're buying, it's because of salespeople, right? If I do this, they're going to take advantage of me, right? If I say this, they're going to use it against me. So our behavior when we buy, or a prospect's behavior when we're trying to convince them to take an action, sell them something, that behavior is not your fault. It's in direct response to every other salesperson they've ever dealt with. Okay? That's, whether they know it or not, that's the mindset they're going into this with. Does this make sense? Yeah. Let's look at how we buy when there's no salesperson involved, just to really kind of drive this home. Okay. Notice what it doesn't start with. Has anyone ever hopped on Amazon.com? Maybe you're looking for a shirt and type in, maybe I'm looking for a shirt, I don't know. <laughs> no one does that, right? You don't mislead Google or Amazon or whoever it is. It's completely different, right? You, you first start with, I, I got a problem, right? No one takes action, no one does any change, and I'll argue all day long if you want to, about no one does anything, takes any type of action unless there's a problem or opportunity they're trying to solve. I don't care if it's buying a Rolls Royce, an Elvis tie, there's, there's an entertainment factor, or so, there's something there. So once we identify I need something, or it'd be nice to have something, or I've gotta get rid of this problem, we just look at our options. We're evaluating options, right? And when we evaluate options, we're really asking ourselves one question. What do I have to give up to get that? If you really think about it, right? anything we want to buy, we have to think, how much money do I have to give up? Do I have to give up potentially other things I could buy with that money? Is it going to take time, resources? Is anyone get, going to get mad at me if I buy that? So we start asking ourselves, what do I have to give up to get that thing? And then we compare one and two. Is giving that stuff up worth solving that problem or, or getting that solution? Then we decide to purchase or, or we pass on it, right? So it's really different the way we buy naturally and the way we buy when a salesperson is involved. Would we, can we all agree on that? Okay, is that a problem? Yeah, makes it tough for anyone who's trying to buy a house. So what I teach is, 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 is an effective selling system, right? And a, a selling system that really um, tries to line up with that natural buying process and we know that every step as we go through it we've got a lot of these fears and anxieties that we've got to overcome. We didn't put them there. But they're automatically putting us in that salesperson's box, right? So we got to keep that stuff in mind when we, when we build a sales process. And a lot of sales training and stuff like that uh, from 20 years ago and more, there's a lot of more stuff we know now that we didn't know then. The, the stuff I referenced, you know, um, the neuro, neuroscience, now called neuroeconomics, the, the science of decision making, um, and all that kind of uh, psychology stuff and, and behavioral economic stuff, we've learned a lot about how people buy. Uh, for example, um, a guy named, uh, oh, now it's gonna escape me. Well, he worked for a company called Huthwaite, Neil Rackham, author of Spin Selling. He did a study of 35,000 salespeople over the course of 12 years. This study alone proved one thing that many of us probably don't know today. What it proved, those 35,000 sales calls, was the more times you ask for a close, the less likely a salesperson was to get it. But what about the ABCs of selling, right? It always be closing? It proved once and for all it was wrong. Okay? There's a lot more data out there today, and we can look at fMRI studies of how people make decisions and things like that. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, but we just have a lot more information, so we gotta incorporate what we now know into a sales process. So do you wanna see it? Do you wanna see the sales process? You ready for it? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you're ready. ready. That's it. It's too simple, right? That crap? People pay me tons of money for that. <laughs> I mean a ton. Like, stupid money. <laughs> it is stupid money. That simple process I helped a company in Stratford land a $250 million Google deal this year with that stupid process. Um, a large, the, the second or third now largest telecom company uh, in the country, we helped them large, uh, land the, their company's biggest deal ever. 
because he was in town, landed the O'Reilly's deal, phone service at $1.5 million a month on a five-year contract. That simple process. And then it's generated a lot more money through everyone I've coached and things like that. This simple process. So that's what I want to talk about for the rest of our time together, specifically that first part of the natural buying system. Is there a problem or opportunity I want to solve? This is what we're going to dig in for the rest of our time, really, because this is the most important. If you can really understand this piece of how people make decisions, you don't really need to know anything else. More stuff you know helps, but this is all you need to know is what's the problem or opportunity that I'm really there to solve? When you guys go buy a house, I guarantee it's not about real estate. You're helping someone get there, get somewhere, get somewhere else. You're helping them escape a problem. And if you focus on that, you'll be a lot more effective at selling. So I'm going to get into the new way of selling. It's a new way of selling because it's just the way we're teaching it now. But people have always made, the, made decisions this way. And they've made decisions based on emotion. And I always get beat up when I say that, right? Emotion, right? Who came, who, who thought the sales guy was going to talk about emotions? A few. Awesome. <laughs> Emotional triggers. That's what I'm going to concentrate on today. And I'm going to explain why emotion is such an important part of any sales process that most of us just completely neglect. And I'm going to talk about how big of a problem that is and kind of some stuff you can do about it. Anyone know who this is? Grade school. Phineas Gage. He was a railroad worker, had a spike driven through his head, but he lived. Okay. Um, Lots of people studied him when he was alive. After he had that spike driven through his head, his behavior radically changed. Okay? What happened was it, it went through the portion of his brain where kind of emotion lived. Right? And emotion is made up of a bunch of different pieces of the brain. That, you know, there's not like the emotion module. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But someone who, who was really fascinated by that was a neuroscientist by the name of Antonio uh, Damasio. He's a, a professor of neuroscience at, at USC. And he started to study that case. And he started to find other people who've had the emotional parts of their brains damaged to kind of see you know, what made them alike, what made them different, what, what conclusions can we draw when, when someone basically loses emotion. These people no longer felt, OK, because some type of brain, brain uh, injury or trauma. They were all smart people, usually above average IQ. right? They were not dim by any means. They just they didn't feel things. So he started to study these people to find out how they were alike and how they were different. And, and some, some pretty crazy stuff came from those studies. One of the most interesting things to me was how they made decisions. Here's the thing they couldn't. He'd ask things like, hey, do you want a turkey sandwich or do you want a ham sandwich for lunch today? They could calculate, uh, you know, if I go to the ham sandwich place, it's this many miles, I don't want to drive that far, or it's this much money, or this is healthier than this, or I like this more than this. They could look at every variable. But because they didn't know how they felt about each decision, they were all unable to make any decision at all. Okay? This was our first kind of glimpse into how important emotion is in, in decision making. And when I talk about the emotional brain, I'm not talking about a chunk of the brain. I just call it the emotional brain, but there's many pieces that make, up, make it up. Um, I don't want to oversimplify this, but I'm going to oversimplify this. But we're going to call it the emotional brain for now. Okay? So, I'm going to kind of go through, I'm going to kind of argue with myself here. If decisions are made emotionally, why? Didn't we kind of grow up our whole lives hearing you never make an emotional decision, right? Isn't, wasn't that kind of beat into us by everybody? Emotional decisions are bad. You don't do it, right? Calm down, cool off, pros and cons, whatever. That's how we make good decisions. So why in the world would we make decisions with that emotional part of our brain? We're hardwired that way biologically. And I'm going to use the Iowa Gambling Task Study to, to kind of explain this. Okay? Why are we hardwired to make decisions emotionally? Well, some scientists did this study to kind of look into this. It was called the Iowa Gambling Task Study. And what happened was they brought a bunch of people in on a gambling experiment. They gave them two grand, fictional two grand to, to gamble with. And the game they played was this. They'd, lo they'd lay four decks of cards in front of them. Two were good decks. Two are bad decks. So that meant if you consistently drew from the bad decks, you lose money. If you consistently draw from the good decks, you make money. Simple enough game? Now, here's what they saw. Blows your mind, doesn't it? I have no idea what that is. That's some of the results they got. But uh, 
what's that really mean, right? That's what we're all, we're all just staring at that. I can't believe no one called me out on it. <laughs> Those are results from the study, but, but let's break it down. What's that actually mean? What did we learn? What we, what we learned was a couple of things. Our logical brain is slow. It, it usually took about 80 cars on average before people could realize and verbalize, oh, there's two good decks and two bad decks. Okay? That's, that's one of the things we learned. The next thing we learned is there were also had sensors placed on them for anxiety, right? And the heart rate would go up and stuff like that. <clears throat> and what they found is after their hands would hover over the bad decks, just 10 cards into it, anxiety would spike. The emotional brain knew within 10 cards what it took the logical brain 80 cards to figure out. It's kind of where gut feelings and stuff like that come from, okay? Um, so why do we make decisions with our emotional brain? Well, here's a logical brain. Here's the emotional brain. It's literally a million times stronger. Our logical brain, due to some shortcomings in a short-term memory, can process three or four variables at a time. More than that, we lose it. The emotional brain can process three to four million variables at any given time, bits of information, okay? It's really powerful. So biologically, does it make sense that we'd use our powerful brain to make most decisions? Simple decisions, A, B decisions, we use our, our, our logical brain. It's, it's easier. So if I say, and if uh, Harvard professor Gerald Zaltman says 95% of our purchase decisions take place unconsciously in that emotional brain, why in the world can't we remember making 95% emotional decisions? As we sit here today, can you guys think of emotional decision, emotional decision, emotion? We have reasons for everything we did, right? Reasons why we're in this room, what we chose for lunch, right? So why in the world, if everything I said before this is true, why can't we, we remember making any, any decisions emotionally? Any ideas? Because it happens to you regardless. All of you are pretty much right. So why do we think our decisions are logical instead of rational? The way we're wired, is we make decisions emotionally, and our rational brain comes up with a reason why that made sense. We justify every single decision we made. Okay, that, that's how it works. Whether we like it or not, that's how it works. And I'll tell you about some studies that, that prove that beyond any shadow of a doubt. Number one, you could just look at a functional MRI machine and how people make decisions. Plenty of tests on that out there now. What they do is they hand someone a clicker, they'd ask a question, they'd watch how the synapses uh, in between the neurons fired at what speeds. Um, and, and then when they knew the answer, they'd click a button, right? What they do is they, if they watch someone enough, they could predict the answer before the person knew what the answer was. The decision was made. They could see by how, which synapses fired how quickly, what their decision was before they had any idea what the decision was. That was our first kind of clue into that. I'll give you a better example. Every summer, my mother-in-law has this 4th of July party. And she goes to like this little cupcake cottage, like, like, all they make are cupcakes. Have you guys seen these places? Like, it's just cup, I, I can't believe it. They're amazing, right? So a cupcake is like 1,000 calories. It's just, they're, they're like eight inches tall. I have a sweet tooth. I mean, I, I just eat junk all day, all day. I buy family-sized bags of candy. I eat it in one sitting. I've got a problem, right? <laughs> so when these cupcakes come out, I'm wanting some of these. But it's July, right? We talked about a pot belly when I got in here. Uh, I diet like crazy all the way up through summer because I just don't want to be out of, the out of shape dad at the pool with my kids. You know, that's my insecurity. I live with it, right? So I diet like crazy. I've got an app on my phone. I'm counting calories. I'm at the gym 5 o'clock every morning. I mean, I go nuts with it. So, so that's really important to me, obviously, just by my actions, right? But I see those cupcakes, and I want one. I think it was this last summer or the one before. I sat there, I looked at my app, lose it. I had like 200 calories left for the day. <laughs> it was like two o'clock. So I'm looking at it, I'm like, I can't, I can't logically, rationally eat that cupcake. It goes against everything I'm trying to do. So I, I go through four or five of them. Right? <laughs> you know how once you get going, you're like, screw it. You know, I went this far. <laughs> Let's, just, let's have some fun today, right? It's a party now. So, so I go through them, and then that, that remorse kicks in. You're like, ugh, that sucks. So you break back open. I broke back open my phone. 
and I started researching, and I found some, some awesome stuff. What I found was when you're on a restricted low-calorie diet for a long period of time, your metabolism is, could slow down. So it's very important that every once in a while you jack those calories way up. <laughs> so I found lots of research to substantiate what I, the decision I made emotionally, and I was not at peace until I could rationalize it. Okay? Now, if you want to get more scientific about it, we can look at people who, who um, have epilepsy, who have seizures. One common practice to, to stop seizures is to cut a, a cord that actually um, connects the right and left side of the brain, the, the emotional and the logical side of the brain, basically. It separates the communication in between the two lobes of the brain and stops a lot of seizures, right? So this, this, this practice became more and more commonplace. And uh, when this happens, you start studying patients to see are there any side effects and, and so on. And, <laughs> what they found uh, when studying people who had this certain procedure done was, was pretty insane. So in one experiment on decision making, obviously that's, that's what, I, what I study and what I love, they, they found a way to, and I never actually researched deep enough to find out how they did this, but they could deliver a message to the emotional side of the brain and the uh, logical side of the brain independently. So basically, you could give an instruction to the emotional side of the brain, the logical brain had no idea what it was doing and vice versa. So in these experiments, they would send a message to the emotional side of the brain, and they'd say something like, hey, uh, go, go get a drink of water. The patient would get up. They'd start walking towards the water fountain in the hall, and they'd stop them. And then they'd send a, a message to the rational side of the brain, who has no idea what's going on. Say, where are you going? Not once, never did anyone say, I have no idea. They would always manufacture an excuse like, it's cold, I'm going to get my coat. The decision was made on the emotional side of the brain, but the rational side of the brain, every single time, found a way to justify the decision that was made. Wow. So in sales, we're oftentimes selling to the wrong side of the brain. Oftentimes, we are trying to sell to the logical side of the brain. Here's how much your house can sell for. Here's how, many, how much money you'd have to put in, into it to get uh, in repairs to get it to that level, right? Here's how much realtor commissions are. Don't they fight you all the way along? Have you guys ever had deals that were just, they're sweet deals. You're like, look, you're making out like a bandit. And they agree, they're very logically like, hey, the numbers don't lie. This is a smoking deal for me. This is a smoking deal for you. And you go, let's do it. And they don't. Has anyone been in those situations? And you're just scratching your head going, how, what happened, right? You can't sell on logic. You need logic. You need logic to back up an emotional decision. But if you're looking to get people, if you're looking to influence people and encourage them to make decisions, you have to appeal to the emotional side of the brain. Going even deeper than that, what we found is the emotional side and the rational side of the brains, they kind of work like a teeter, teeter totter, which means when the emotional side's all revved up, the rational side, very little activity there, and then vice versa. Okay? So if people make decisions, because we're biologically hardwired to do so emotionally, but we're selling logically, so that, that logical side of the brain is fired up, what that really means is we make it almost impossible for someone to make a decision. We've shut down the side of their brain where action comes from. That's why those things happen. That's why deals that make perfect sense, people sometimes don't take action on. And you can argue about the numbers till you're blue in the face, but they, it just doesn't feel right. There's something about it, I don't know. I gotta think about it. I gotta ask you know, Aunt Susie, whatever it is. Okay. So humans can't be empathetic and logical at the same time. Okay. So I blew through my slides way faster than I thought I would, which is awesome for all of you guys, because you don't have to sit here for all that much longer. But let's go ahead and maybe use this extra time just to talk a little bit more about this, answer some questions, um, talk about what you can do when people do certain things to you when you're trying to buy or sell a house. And if you want, we can use the remaining uh, 15 minutes or whatever it is just to kind of dig into some of this stuff. Would you guys like to do that? Yes. Uh, I'm not really convinced. Yes. Yes. All right. So if that's okay, is that okay if I do, Dixie? Yeah. 
Yeah? Well, the, the whole last 15 minute part was not, that wasn't planned. I was supposed to go until, yeah. So let's, let's go for it. First question. So it sounds like you're saying that we need to appeal to their emotions rather than just pure logic. Like, oh, just imagine how good it's going to feel to get this off your back. Exactly. And, and let's, let's, let's use some examples. So let me tell you a story. Um, this week, I've got a two-year-old. His name is Miles. I'm not exactly sure he's mine. Um, I say that jokingly, but the kid, oh, blue eyes, bright blonde hair, where did you come from? Uh, I know he's mine because he got all my bad stuff, the allergies and all that kind of stuff, right? And, and I love my wife, obviously. I trust her. <laughs> but this kid, man, I love him to pieces. He, he's, so, he, he's a character, and I, I do anything for him, as we all, for, for any of our kids. And sometimes he gets sick, right? Like kids do. They get the sniffles, they go to daycare, they're dragging stuff home. And when he gets sick, my wife tells me to go to Walgreens, down on the corner of Campbell and 14 in Nixa, where we live, and to get something for the kid, some children's Tylenol or something. So I make this trip often. And when I go and I, I, I drive down the road and I get there, um, you see the big aisle. Kids, kids have their own special medicine section now. I don't know when this started, but it, they got it. And uh, there's, there's options everywhere, right? And there's medicine for two bucks, cough syrup for 15 bucks. There's organic stuff. Um, I don't think any of it works. He's gonna be better in the morning no matter what I give him, right? That's just the way kids work. Uh, so I'm not really emotionally vested in this decision. I get this medicine, same thing in the morning, this medicine, same thing in the morning. So how do you guys think I make my decision on which one I'm gonna buy? 100% price, <laughs> cheapest one every single time, okay? <laughs> this week, uh, Tuesday, uh, my wife and I were dropping off my car to get serviced. We were never without a car, right? But I said, honey, let's go have some lunch. We'll drop off the car. We'll grab an Uber, get some lunch, and then blah, blah, blah. So we drop off the car. We get in the Uber. We're going to lunch, and her cell phone rings, and she starts crying. Uh, Miles has this severe peanut allergy, and he grabbed someone's peanut butter sandwich, right? And uh, his throat was closing up. The ambulance was on the way to daycare. They, you got to get this EpiPen and jab it into the kid's leg. He's not really, not really big enough even for it. The doctor says he needs it because if something happens, he needs it to live. But he's so small that it can go through his thigh into the bone in places where that pen's, pen's not supposed to go. It was a big deal, right? It was a big deal. So we do our stuff. We, we get to the hospital. So can you imagine how you'd feel if your two-year-old was whisked, had this traumatic event happen, jabbed in the thigh with a needle like this big, taken by strangers, throats closing up, in an ambulance, going to the hospital, mom and dad nowhere around? I mean, could you imagine that? Now, luckily, everything ended up OK. But imagine if, imagine if I walked into that, to that hospital, and the doctor said to me, listen, this is bad. We don't know what's going to happen. We're going to do whatever we can. But before we go, I need your permission, because this might be tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe a million dollars, depending on what we find, what we have to do. What do you think I'm going to say? Absolutely. Now, this is my child's health. At the beginning of the story, a couple bucks determined what I bought. Not a lot of emotional investment there. He's going to be fine no matter, no matter what. When emotion gets high enough, money loses all value. Right? Zero value. So emotion plays a huge part in every decision. And that's what you've got to get to. What problem are you there to solve? And whatever you're selling, whatever you're trying to influence someone to do, whatever you're trying to help someone to do, you have to determine what problem you're there to solve. And you've got to take, take it to an emotional level. I understand you have this problem, but how does it impact you? There's lots of ways you can ask those questions. There's actually three very specific questions you ask in a specific order to get there. But that's where you want to get to. So it's a very long-winded way to answer your question. But I think I ate up some time. <laughs> uh, any, another question? Anybody? Uh, what's the three questions? 
Oh, we'll get to that in a sec. I got to use the microphone, however. I know I'll get in trouble if someone doesn't use it. Okay, so if you have a seller who you've talked to and you know they seemed interested in talking to you, uh, but for whatever reason they said, well, you need to call back another time. Well, I called back another time, and they never called back. Um, mm -hmm. They never returned my call. But then since that time, they've dropped the price like two or three times. So I'm like, what do I need to do other than consistent follow-up? What, what exactly should I be doing or saying to get them to actually pick up the phone and call me back? Right, so we use a tactic. So obviously I've got young kids right now, right? Who else has young kids or, or who've had young kids? Probably most of us, right? I mean, a lot of people have kids. Um, I'll tell you something my, my two and my four-year-old do. We got toys all over the house. When you have as many kids as I do, that just happens. And a toy will sit in the middle of a room for weeks sometimes, right? Maybe up against the wall, wherever it belongs. And one of them, Miles or Jackson, will walk up and touch the toy. And the other one, like lightning, <laughs> right? Zooms, they just know, and they zoom across the house. They go, mine, 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 mine. <clears throat> That's something called psychological reactants. We want what we can't have. And we push back. Uh, kind of like Newton's law, right? Opposite uh, reaction to every action. So what we do in those cases is we don't talk about why they might want to sell. Uh, well, there's two things we can do. Number one, push back and say, hey, listen, I'm guessing no matter what I could offer you, however quickly I could buy this house, there's no way you're selling it. They'll argue with you. They'll say, you're crazy. I want rid of this house. Not enough to meet with me. They'll start to convince you. So instead of pushing for that appointment, you go the other way and you use psychological reactants in your favor. There's another trick you can use to find out where does that little bit of motivation lie. Everyone will make decisions based on their own reasons, not ours. We got to find out where that motivation lives. So lots of times if I'm with a prospect and they're not very motivated, I'm having trouble getting them to take some action. I got to get them a little emotionally charged, right? It's important. So how do I do that? How do I find out what their motivation is? I ask a simple question. I first give them autonomy and say, hey, listen, this is obviously 100% up to you. And then I ask this question. I know you decided not to, but if you ever did decide to meet with me or find out what I could offer or you know, extend this conversation, if you ever decided to do that, why would you? And whatever they say next is the tiniest bit of motivation, all that you need to get them to that next level. Once they say that, you can just dig in a little bit. Really, I'm surprised you said that. Why, why'd you bring that up? And you could take them to that emotional level. Um, an example of this, th that why question, um, it was actually invented at, at Yale Medical School. So I'll tell you a quick story, and then I think we're, we're wrapping it up. So let me try to remember some names here. I absolutely cannot. But there's a doctor, uh, Michael Pantalone, at Yale Medical School. And uh, an a local emergency room came to this doctor at Yale and, and asked him a question. And this ties into that last question, just it dovetails right into it. He said, listen, we got a problem. In our emergency room, we've got basically drunks who are coming in all the time and over and over again with the same illnesses and injuries. No matter what we say or what we do, they're coming into the emergency room. So, you know, they're taking up time, resources. If you're dealing with the same people over and over, you're not dealing with other people. If you're dealing with the same people over and over, you're not helping them. Doctors are there to help. So this is a big problem, right? No matter what we do, we can't get them to change. So he came in, he started investigating, he looked at the procedure. They'd come in, uh, they'd speak to a doctor. A doctor had on average seven minutes to speak with their patients in a busy, busy, busy emergency room setting. And the doctor would try to convince them while treating them to stop drinking, go get help, get in a program, give them a pamphlet. Seven minutes. So he studied, and he studied the questions they were asking. And the questions they were asking is, Stuff like, why can't you stop? Why won't you just put it down? Why, why can't you? Why won't you? Uh, why wouldn't you? Why couldn't you? He simply flipped the questions around, that motivation question, if you did. If you did decide to get help, if you did decide to stop drinking, why would you? That brought out enough motivation for the first time. Often in these people's lives, they figured, well, I would for motivation. And based on that seven-minute conversation, that changed the course of trauma visits and ERs across the country. That's now standard procedure to ask that question, to, to basically influence people 
in under seven minutes in medical uh, facilities around the country. It's taught in every medical school um, or trauma ER medical school across the country. Common practice in most hospitals. Simply changing why can't you, why won't you into if you decided to, why would you? Recidivism, uh, recidivism rates in that specific ER dropped 50% by changing that one question. No medicine, nothing else. So uh, Dr. Michael Pantalone, I can't remember the name of his book, but you could probably look it up. So guys, I think, am I out of time? Three questions. Three questions. Three questions. Hold, hold on. There's three questions I was supposed to answer. What are the three questions? So this is an adaptation from uh, spin selling. Uh, that study I told you about, 35,000 sales calls over the course of 12 years, what were the most successful salespeople doing? Well, they found patterns. They all did the exact same thing. They all asked three types of questions, actually four, but one of them doesn't matter, so I'm tossing it out. There's, they asked three types of questions. They asked them in a specific order and spent a certain amount of time on each one, and those are the most successful. They could actually start listening to sales calls and predict who, would be the, who were the most successful salespeople by the questions they asked and how much time they spent on each type of question. The three questions were number one, problem. How does every decision start? What's the problem I'm here to solve? They'd only spend a little bit of time there though. The sales reps who spent a lot of time on that, too much time, poor closing rates. The good, a little more than mediocre, the good salespeople asked about impact. They got to the problem and they asked, I get it, that sucks. But what I'm not hearing is how's that impacting you? They'd spend a lot of time on impact. How is this impacting the way you spend your time? What you think about? How you feel? Right? Emotionally, spiritually, physically? All that type of stuff depending on the situation. The sales reps who asked that were good. The very top sales reps took it a step further and they asked um, what I call picture perfect questions. He called it needs something questions, doesn't matter. But basically, he'd ask them about their picture-perfect situation. So, so let me walk you through this. They'd find, out a, he'd, they'd find out a problem. They'd have the prospect paint this, get them to, to, to paint this very vivid picture of, of how that's actually impacting them. You always get to emotional questions. You start to hear like, things like, it sucks. I hate it. I'm stressed out. I can't deal with this. And then they would take him to the picture-perfect. If he didn't have to deal with it, would anything even change? What would you think about? If you sold the place, where would you go live? Why there? Right? What would that be like? So what the, the picture the prospect paints in their mind without even knowing it is where they're at and what that feels like and where they could be and what that feels like. The gap in between is motivation. That's how you can take a prospect. How many people talk to prospects who are quote unquote fine? Right? Oh, I'm fine. You can give me a number. I don't really need to sell. You need to create that gap in between where they're at and where they want to be. You, you know this already in your own lives. How many of you guys um, bought maybe a new car or a new home? And you love that car or you love that home. It's what you've always wanted and it's perfect in every way. But then you hop in a buddy's car or you go to a party at this big, beautiful house and all of a sudden, a second ago, you were perfectly content with what you had. But now that you saw a better picture-perfect scenario, you're motivated to work harder, make more money, all those kinds of things. So is that ringing any bells to anybody? You were fine, quote unquote fine, until someone painted a picture of a better reality. And in an instant, motivation. Okay? Right, guys, I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak with you.